day when I come into the office, I keep thinking about all the work we've done here over the past 20 years as independent producers, films, TV shows, and videos. And I'm thinking these should be made more widely available. I want viewers to know why I did what I did and what I tried to get at that's not always obvious. I'd like kids and students starting out in media work to know that the mainstream approach is not the only approach, that there's another sensibility, another way of reporting news and making films. I've spent a lifetime doing stories, but I've also lived one. Can I tell that without being self-emotional or hyped up? Is it a story anyone would want to watch? I sure hope so. From activism to journalism, from rock and roll radio to network television, from crises in America to an immersion in South Africa, it's got celebrity glitz and investigative substance, and a worldwide whirlwind of media adventures and submerged hopes. He's the author of The More You Watch, The Less You Know, News Dissector, Danny Shecker. This is a film about journalism through the eyes of a journalist who can't stand most of what passes for journalism. I blinked again and suddenly 1960 had become 60. Another marker, a new transition point. Ignition with tuition to erudition. Zero to 60. Watch me fly in the flash of that blinking eye. This is a film about one media maven's attempt to challenge the news business as a media maker and a media critic. Subjective chronicle ranging over four decades of work. A career built more on a sense of mission than money. It's offered up as one model for how independent journalism can raise deeper questions. From the 60s to 60, feeling better than I should, forward ever, backward never. Blink on, O oh ship of fate. Blink on and bring it on. Thank you. So I'm no Allen Ginsberg, but he was a friend and an influence. I was honored to salute the late poet at a massive tribute at a New York cathedral. He was also my media hero for the reasons I cited. Before logos and branding, he branded himself. Always there with the news we never knew. The anchor of GNN, the Ginsberg News Network. The poet ahead of the news with the times never quite able to catch up. We miss you, Al. Although my real muse and inspiration was another poet, my mom, Ruth Lisa Schechter, when I grew up in a Bronx housing project. Okay, just a little taste of this film that's available, and I think my interest students, uh, because I think a lot of times media courses and media analysis, it's all very heavy, it's not very personal, it doesn't really connect often with people's aspirations about what they want to do with their lives. And so maybe it would be helpful uh, to offer some models, not just you know the high and the mighty, uh, the eye of stones and the like, but perhaps people who are in the trenches now trying to do uh, what they can to offer another kind of uh, pro programming, production, analysis, and the like. Uh, right now, we're talking about our media system, but. Behind our media system is another industry that powers it, and that system is advertising. Strange, is it not, to find advertising showing up on the great television networks, advertising for advertising. I've never seen that, have you? The New York Times reports every year CBS runs 8,000 of its own self-promoting spots on television eight times more than what the biggest Madison Avenue shop turns out. 
worth about $500 million in airtime. In addition, the network purchases around $40 million of advertising time and space from other media networks, ABC and NBC. They mount expensive uh, and extensive campaigns of their own. CBS is considered the broadest, the deepest, the most intensive. And they're not just advertising for viewers. They're not just there to tell viewers about what's on. They're advertising literally to get people to advertise with them, to sell the power of television in the same way they sell products uh, to serve you know, their advertisers. Uh, and the economic crisis, of course, has dampened all commercial business, so they're now in the business of actually uh, selling themselves, which is kind of unusual. A week ago, uh, what the networks call the upfronts, which is where they pitch their programming for the next season, uh, uh, an unusual thing happened. It was at Lincoln Center. It was a big event for TV critics and, and advertisers. Jimmy Kimmel, the comic, turned his own fire on his own network, saying that what they were saying, his own network, is baloney. He did a routine on the absurdity of selling shows that we, within a few months mostly will be canceled, which is what happens every year. He said ABC would cancel 90% of the shows being promoted and that the numbers being spun to sell the news programs were total lies. Ha <laughs> ha. Went the audience. Later, ABC dismissed his insights as much ado about nothing. They wish. The collapse of the mainstream media is a significant turning point, something many in this room probably have long wished for. If you read Art Voice this week, you'll find a column by one of the organizers of this uh, conference arguing, die zombie media, zombie newspapers die. Essentially, what the economy can't do, he'd like to see happen in terms of the complete termination you know, probably of the Buffalo News and other newspapers throughout America, which I, I disagree with, but I can understand his frustration and his anger with the misinformation that is so massive in all of our media outlets. On the other hand, I have friends and people in this room who work for that paper who I know have done some really good stuff over the years. Uh, we're in a situation where, you know, the American people are getting less and less. Years ago in New York, CBS News locally had a, an advertising slogan, which was, more news in less time. The idea was a higher story count on every newscast, more promos, more coming up next, and all the rest of it. And what we've seen is the replacement of journalism and news with, with uh, infotainment on almost every level, political polarization used as a technique of building audience of actually doing political organizing in the guise of offering news and commentary. That's the role of Fox. Uh, but wars were increasingly sanitized and critical journalism has been increasingly marginalized. Happily for many of us, the emergence of the web created a noisy new arena for endless discourse and participation, an online pasture for aggregators, bloggers, a place to be seen and even occasionally heard. Uh, but quiet as it's kept, the vast majority of online news seekers go to the big commercial sites, the AOLs, the Yahoos, uh, and the like, and the newspaper websites, where they consume often headlines, not necessarily in-depth news and information. Uh, is the web a serious way to reach people, raise awareness, or a virtual playground filled with topper stories? As in, you think that's bad? Listen to this. Uh, and in which 9-11 uh, truthers only connect often with other 9-11 truthers. In other words, we seek out views that we agree with, we find voices that we respect, but we're not necessarily confronted with challenging and critical discourse all too often. People s tend to seek out those sites that reinforce and confirm their political views. Increasingly, media attention revolves around this type of discourse and has become an electronic battleground with a scandal or issue of the week 
Media outlets, for example, love the non debate between President Obama and Dick Cheney, which is, I believe, how you say his last name, uh, kind of relishing in the appearance of conflict. Oh my God, did you see so, whatever it is? Kind of breathless uh, way that, you know, I think John Stewart alone and some others capture uh, with great frequency the way in which uh, news babble you know, has taken over and cliche has taken over all of these channels, basically saying the same thing in the same way. Uh, instead of us helping to connect the dots by understanding political interests and relationships, what's really going on behind the scenes, media personalizes and it demonizes. It becomes a headline hit parade, a shortening of already short attention spans with more compression and now Twitterization, with no thought more than 140 characters allowed to percolate through. Issues that are more complicated, perhaps more important, are given much shorter shrift. So this seems to be the, ten, the trend of, of where it's going. The new editor of Newsweek was interviewed about their new reduced uh, magazine and talked about how you know, uh, it's hard to you know, get attention. So therefore, you have to, you know, uh, basically uh, take the journalism out of journalism. It's so much easier also to stay with a familiar debate, say torture, demonize Bush and Cheney for the umpteenth time, than to recognize the crimes of Wall Street and the way they were enabled on a bipartisan basis by a political system that was bought and is bought and paid for. Some of you may know that I did the film In Debt We Trust in 2006, warning of this credit crash. I followed up with a book called Plunder, and we are gonna have some book signings afterwards uh, here. Uh, a book called Plunder now being made into a documentary on the crimes of Wall Street to see the financial crisis as a crime story, not just a bunch of mistakes by otherwise well-intentioned businessmen who miscalculated on their risk formulas. Little response from, quote, what's left of the left in America, which is much more uh, consumed with sort of settling scores, avenging the crimes of Iraq, which deserve to be avenged by, by all means. But there's no attempt here to look at the economic pain 15 million people are more out of work, 10 million losing their homes, the economy is still on life support, the progressive movement largely looks the other way, as does the progressive media, in my experience. Very little of the alternative and, and critical analysis that one finds in financial blogs written by people who are in Wall Street, who know how it works, who are insiders, finds its way into left publications that I see. And I, that's what I do for a living, is to monitor all of this stuff. I write about it every single day, almost 3,000 words a day, obsessively, on Media Channel and my News Dissector blog. So I'm trying to follow all of this, and I'm very interested in what the, you know, the real pros, uh, the economists and the you know, investors are saying about this, because although they are often ideological in their approach, they're you know, Ayn Rand supporters or libertarians or, or whatever, there is some insight there about power relationships that I find missing in the discourse and in the interest, attention span of people uh, in the left. Uh, I, I went to moveon.org. I went to all of these organizations about this whole credit card, you know, aspect of the crisis and the credit crunch, subprime lending that I've been calling subcrime lending. And I, I, I would say that there was very little interest. Our members said move on, have not made that a priority. Of course, nobody's attempted to educate them about any of these issues either. So the organizations that have some muscle have sort of stayed away from it and instead saw their role as sort of hyping or following the Democratic Party and its uh, fortunes without any sort of critical edge. Uh, we all know about denial, but activism in my mind, should be responsive to this. Uh, I feel we need to, we need a jail out, not just a bailout. I feel that we need to 
examine the crimes of Wall Street and the impact it's had on ordinary people. Maybe because I come from a working class family, because my father worked in the shops, because um, he was a union member and, and I was a shop steward when I worked at WBCN in Boston. Maybe I'm more sensitive to this than others are, but in the same way that Lisa Vivas this morning indicted the lack of interest in Africa, the lack of interest in the rest of the world. I find a lack of interest in America among Americans about who's really behind our economic system. There's a, so much of a sense that somehow power is in the White House. Power is in Congress without nary a look at who's funding all these legislative initiatives and who's behind it. Even our election coverage, I find, really lacking. You know, uh, a tendency to just mirror and reflect what the mainstream media cable news outlets are saying, you know, and quoting them endlessly on various blogs and the like. I just made this film, uh, Barack Obama, People's President. And what it is, is, I was interested in one little simple question. How did this guy win? How did he go from 10% recognition two years ago to winning the election? And of course, when you turn to most of the media, you don't have a clue because they're talking about polls, they're talking about pundits, they're talking about when well, McCain said this, and Sarah Palin said that, and, and, and Obama said this, and the like. But nobody's looking at the actual organization going on at the ground level. How did he use the internet successfully? How did he organize people? How did he appeal to young people? Maybe we could learn something from this. Uh, to put it to use in perhaps more progressive political activism. And that's why I've made this film. It's, it was just actually on television on a channel which a week later declared itself bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> but I could never get it on, on PBS. The reaction of PBS is you don't have both sides. Well, what are both sides in all of this? There's an issue of journalistic inquiry here that needs to be pursued. And I don't find these questions being raised a lot in the, in the, in the media uh, environment and in the media academy. Earlier, starting in 2003, I wrote two books. And then the first, the first book on the Iraq war, just like I did the first book on the financial crisis. And believe me, I don't advise that because being first is, is never a good idea. It, you know, being last is probably a better idea because by then, you know, the conventional wisdom has now altered its sense of priorities and suddenly recognized the value of, of this type of inquiry. But I, I did two books and, and made the film WMD, Weapons of Mass Deception. It showed how our media promoted the Iraq war. It argued that without our media's cooperation and complicity, there could have been no Iraq war. It basically said that it wasn't just Bush and his generals and, and the people that supported him and the right in America uh, and his talking points, but it was the media embracing this cause, not looking at it critically, not analyzing it carefully, not challenging uh, it until years later. And at the same time, our anti-war movement, in my view, ritualistically continued the same kind of practice Every fall, every spring, let's march on the White House and yell at Bush. Ten blocks from the White House, the offices of the Washington Post. Ten blocks away, 100,000 people in front of the White House, nobody in front of the Washington Post, questioning you know, their editorial policies and practices and supporting this war and other publications as well. Uh, you know, and TV networks, all with bureaus in Washington, not being challenged at all. And focusing now almost totally on war crimes, torture and the like, not looking at media crimes, the way this war was distorted and systematically miscovered, undercovered and the like. I've called for a media crimes tribunal. I did so in, in Rome at a, at, a, at a big international conference about uh, about the crimes of, of Iraq. But most of the anti-war movement ignored this, never targeting media outlets, and instead these continue its, its, its traditional approach of oppositional protest and yelling slogans at people who weren't paying attention. 
as opposed to challenging people who might have paid attention if they were challenged in a, in a creative and interesting way. So I feel this is a failure, not just of, quote, the left, but people who are teaching people about the importance of media. I find that a lot of the discourse has become extremely parochial, academic, uh, almost, uh, you know, organized ar around, you know, kind of papers that are more kind of intellectual masturbatory exercises, uh, you know, than real social critique that moves people to act. And that's what I was hoping to say here. Uh, with respect, because actually I went to an excellent um, uh, lecture earlier today about ecotourism, uh, where I learned that it's not okay to kiss a dolphin. Uh, I also, I also <laughs> heard Lisa speak this morning. I went and it did hear an interesting analysis of two, uh, you know, punk rock bands that refused to uh, accept money from General Motors uh, for advertising the commodification of culture. It was a little academic in its tone, but I thought it was very interesting uh, in its analysis and, and something that, you know, uh, struck me, even though it had the longest title of any uh, one of the papers given here. At any event, I do think that culture is very important and that political culture is what shapes ideas and shapes all of us. And that's partly why I've been involved over the years with you know, rock and roll. I started at WBCN in Boston, the Rock of Boston. I worked there as the news dissector on a music station for 10 years. And I helped do the Sun City uh, record against apartheid, the remake of uh, John Lennon's uh, Give Peace a Chance, We Are Family after 9-11. I'm working on something now uh, for, to try to promote health uh, reform in America. So I think we need a broader cultural canvas in which to situate our own intellectual ideas and how to express those ideas in a way that connects with an audience that goes beyond whatever world we're in, whether it's a media world, an independent media world, or an academic world. I think we need to convince people that the media is not simply some separate institution, but an arm a power center in American life. We're talking about the military media industrial complex. All of them entwined together in various ways. Uh, and I don't think media scholars have looked at it enough in an integrated way. So that's my take on this. Uh, I, I also think uh, that we have to learn something from the Obama campaign in terms of updating our own techniques of using social networking, uh, using uh, online forums and formats to talk to the younger people who are your students, and that's the language that they're communicating in, to find a way to inspire them, not simply to inform them. And it is a reason, for example, that so many young people watch The Daily Show Okay, and rally behind it, and Stephen Colbert and the rest. Although it, I believe that it reinforces attitude, not conveys information. It, it gives people a sense of being righteous and superior to the people being ridiculed or, or uh, challenged. And I think we have to fill in the gap there in terms of information, analysis, a criticism, a history of how things happen, as opposed to just reacting to whatever the latest breaking news story might be. Back in 1995, the late best-selling author, screenwriter, Michael Crichton, who gave us uh, Jurassic Park, compared the American media uh, to other dinosaurs and said it was on the way to extinction. It did so in Project Censored, actually, an introduction to the 1995 edition. Uh, 10 years later, noting that his prophecy was just beginning to be realized, I quoted his passage in a book I wrote called The Death of Media from Melville Press. I, you know, I see this transition as part of the fight for democracy, not simply about the media. I don't disconnect understanding what media does to how that fertilizes or undermines our democracy. 
and every day seems to bring a confirmation that Crichton was onto something. Did I pronounce this right? Is that right? Yeah. The big question remains, what does this mean for those of us who are critics of the media system? What does it mean to those of us who understand its many defects and, but, and also its real functions? How can we adapt and harness the power of this new media environment? Students flock to media courses only to find out how few media jobs are out there, many often leaving in frustration and disillusionment after having their, their greatest spirits, you know, their, their best, uh, you know, si best side of their, their, their angels appealed to, they find themselves running up against reality very quickly. The government is pumping money into road building and infrastructure projects, while the press, the infrastructure of democracy, is collapsing. We have more media than ever, but many of us still know less and less. After all, why learn anything if you can just Google it? Go to Wikipedia, that's all you need to know. Now, how many of you get papers written from that single source repeatedly and you sort of are onto it so you can challenge it? Our challenge is to redefine media, to think about what we find interesting and what we would like to know and what kind of contribution we can make. I was very impressed earlier today sitting in on a class of students who are investigating the police in Buffalo and are taking that on as a challenge to actually learn about how that bureaucracy works, how and why people you know, are often uh, treated badly by it. And you know, so that to me is the kind of practical hands-on learning that, that is really valuable because it throws kids into reality, into other people's reality, not just their own hermetically sealed worlds. Is there room for citizen journalism and more collaborative media projects, more critical thinking in our institutions? If so, how do we achieve it? We started mediachannel.org 10 years ago. Um, my partner came out of CBS, I came out of ABC. We felt there needed to be some force out there to try to hold media accountable. Not simply, and I respect Project Censor, but not simply to go and say this wasn't covered or that wasn't covered, but to critique what is being covered every day when it's fresh in people's minds. And I started doing this blog and have continued doing it at, I would say, uh, sometimes questioning whether or not I should continue doing it. But I'm doing it in part because I think that type of witnessing, that type of analysis that's contemporary, that's actually happening while all this is going on, will have the most impact, which doesn't you know, deprecate more scholarly studies after the fact. I'm all for that, too. But I think there needs to be a counter-narrative to the narrative that's been constructed. There needs to be people who are paying attention, making connections, particularly for young people, filling them in on some of the background about these institutions and challenging them to read between the lines, uh, to look at what's being left out as opposed to just what's on, to get away from this you know, fascination with, did you hear what Bill O'Reilly said last night? Isn't that terrible? as if Bill O'Reilly deserves to be taken seriously in this way. How, much, how many of you know about his audience, how old they are, where they come from? Uh, but no, it, it's on TV. Therefore, it has to become the preoccupation you know, of, 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 of left media. Bash the right. And people love it. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Alternate loves those kinds of stories. Did you see what Glenn Beck said? Ugh. Disgusting, you know, in other words, appealing to this vicarious in the same way that we have to see these torture videos. We must see them. Go to a, a video store. There are plenty of better made torture videos that you can rent if you need to see them. It's a vicarious, in my mind, exercise that's not gonna really teach us anything that we don't already know which is that the war was criminal, it was wrong, it was brutal, uh, and it brutalized everybody involved in it. And that's what we need to know, and that's what we need to resist. We need to support the Iraq veterans who have stood up 
often against their own families, against their own comrades and brothers, to actually speak out about this, how brave that is. And we, we need to support their efforts uh, as well. But we also need to advance their efforts by showing and validating uh, their arguments to the degree that we can. So the challenge we face is not just rebuilding or propping up a media system that's flawed and failing, but creating one that speaks to the imagination of a new generation who have a need to know and a right to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wish you could see the rest of this film. The books are outside. I'm going to sign. But I'd love to have a little bit of a discourse, not just questions, but comments or something that we can discuss about a number of the ideas that I've thrown out here, uh, which are quite a few, reflecting you know, my experience, which goes back, really, to being a high school editor in 1960. OK, so I've been around this business for a long time. I've worked in radio. I've worked in, in print. I've worked in television, new local, and cable, and network. Uh, and I'm working as an independent uh, producer, as a video maker, but I've never stop being a troublemaker too. Any comments, questions? <laughs> I've said it all. No, go ahead. Um, I'm curious about how you see the role of, uh, of technology that in, in, um, uh, maybe creating what you're talking about. Because on the one hand, you refer to the gym, you should encourage you know, using social networking sites and uh, you know, new technologies. And then a number of times when you're speaking, you kind of um, bash Twitter and bash you well, know, Twitter. Twitter. Google. Yeah, it's the contradiction of our lives. We can't, we realize it's, it's, it's limited, uh, but we can't ignore it uh, in the same way that because video cameras are cheaper and better, doesn't mean I'm using the same ones. You know, I'm using my gold red lens camera. You know, I'm not. I'm trying to use new technology that, that would be more impactful, perhaps. I guess in terms of talking about uh, how to reach students. Um, I mean, if, if the bias of the technology of Twitter, right, is to sort of condense everything to just a few words, then how does that maybe work with, um, you know, the idea of trying to engage students in, in critical scholarship? I mean, like, are those things, how compatible are these? Well, I think, you you know, Malcolm X said, by every means, by any means, by all, every means necessary. Okay, by all means, what's the phrase exactly? By any means necessary, okay? And I knew Malcolm X, and I know Malcolm X. Anyway, he, uh, you know, didn't think there was one way, one right way. And I don't think there is one right way. And there was a recent study which just reported the other day about texting, about the effects of people living in a speeded up technological environment where they're under tremendous pressure to check their emails every half hour, every 10 minutes, every 20 minutes. You feel like they're tethered to technology. They can't sleep. They're, they're showing physical symptoms of distress because of their difficulty in mastering, you know, this whole speed up environment that we're in. So there are dangers here. I haven't seen any studies on Twitter yet. I'm just sort of playing with it. I'm a Twitter newbie at dissector events. I'm um, using it basically to try to promote what I'm doing in other media right now. <coughs> I've hardly mastered it. I've been blogging for all these years. I still don't know how to put pictures into my blog. I have somebody helping me do that. You know, I'm still kind of, uh, you know, somebody who started out on a typewriter. Although I did have, for those in the room, I might remember one of the first Osborne uh, computers a century ago. So. You know, I, I, I like technology. I try to use it. I did, you know, I've lost one Mac to a bowl of chicken soup being flung <laughs> into it. I've, I've uh, you know, broken the screen on another one. And I won't say I'm a role model of, you know, techno caring. But, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a tool that, you know, it's hard to think of going back to carbon paper, OK? Going back to the days. Of, of earlier technology. So 
you know, and you don't have to just write out stones anymore. You know, there is a progression in human history. At the other, on the other hand, the key criteria for progression is it helping people be empowered? Is it helping them think more about what's going on to them in the world? Is it helping them to act in a way that can intervene uh, in things? And this is, I think, the questions that there are no answers to, but we have to experiment with and encourage to the best of our ability you know, to uh, get people you know, engaged. We have you know, interns at our company, like I know other people do. We, we seek out people from other countries because we want to have some sort of cultural mix as well as you know, uh, gender mix or whatever. We want to try to uh, learn from the, a lot of these young people. We've had some success and we've had some failures, but we're still trying. We've been in business unbelievably for 23 years, and each year seems to be our last. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to survive much longer because there is no investment base, there is no, uh, you know, fundraising foundations and all the rest of it. Particularly as you move into challenging real power, as you go beyond the discourse, you know, of saying, you know, that, uh, you know, we did a film, 9/11 Press for Truth, questioning what he helped on it, questioning the 9/11 Commission. A lot of people told us, don't touch that subject. That's poison. You're going to be considered a uh, conspiracy nut. That's why I'm nervous today about the financial crimes uh, investigation that's been promised by this administration. Who's going to be on it? Uh, how, you know, there was the Pecora Commission after the crash of 29 that actually identified some of the criminal behavior that led to uh, the crash of 29. Is that going to happen now? You know, it really will depend on our vigilance. Is this issue even in our internal radar screens? Do we think about, when we read about this stuff, it's somebody else's problem? You know, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, many of us don't connect to it because it's complicated. There are a lot of words we don't know, you know, derivatives, or credit for false swaps, or this or that. You know, and, and instead of saying, hey, this is interesting, let me learn about this. You know, we stay with what is familiar to us, what's comfortable to us. Uh, and that's something we have to try not to do, in my opinion. I'm sorry, did I get any of your answer? I mean, this is good. You said, uh, in the middle of the was, uh, you had said that, um, that here in America, you don't get many interviews, but like you know, your European interviews in Germany, and they want to interview. Uh, so I was Only wondering. one mainstream newspaper in America reviewed my book to London, Buffalo News. Now, uh, uh, you know, when I tried to get my book published, I, this time around I had a great agent, you know, from a big literary agency, loved what I was doing, and we went to 30 publishers, and 30 publishers turned it down because I was an alarmist, I was a doom and gloomer, and I was exaggerating, obviously. But one of them told me the real story, the real story was this which is sort of ironic because the company I'm about to mention runs the, bus, the bookstore at Buffalo State. And you know, basically said, the one, there's one person in America that has to like this book if it's going to be successful, have a chance of being successful. I said, one person? What are you talking about? A business book buyer at Barnes & Noble has to like the book. And they're not going to like the book for one very simple reason. You don't have any stock tips in it about how to get rich. I say, well, my tip is not to buy stocks because the market is at a down. I don't want to hear that. So as a result, I was you know, unsuccessful. I found a smaller publisher who's put it out. But the problem is I don't have the marketing muscle. Many of us don't realize you know, what it takes to promote something. My award is Fahrenheit 9-11, big success. $60 million spent in marketing and promotion, including money from Disney, who we had a kind of food fight with. Okay? It was successful, but it takes money to make money. And that's the lesson of uh, kind of American, you know, capitalism and promotion. If you're independent uh, or, or, you know, whoever you are, it's the same 
dynamic open unless you have a built-in constituency. You know? So I, I'm just saying that the challenge here is to try to think about how we can support each other more. How we can call these resources to the attention of our students more. How we can engage in discussions and debates on topics we may not be comfortable with. Do you think the uh, left press in uh, North America conveys uh, an attractive or convincing picture of what a socialist North America might look like? No, uh, I, I don't. I think that you know, the whole discussion of socialism has been reintroduced into the political debate in America by the right wing. They've reintroduced it. They're calling Obama a socialist and a lot of other things. Okay? Distorting, you know, at least it was left to the socialists to basically reject this. But, you know, it's the only time socialists get into the news at all. You know, say Obama's not a socialist. So, I don't feel that there is. There are some people who've been trying to offer visions and ideas for how the economy can be reorganized differently. Michael Albert in Z Magazine and in his books have has been raising ideas. Other, there are other uh, very good radical economists. One of them, James Galbraith in Texas. Uh, his father was the great John Kenneth Galbraith, who wrote about the Depression. I tried to make a film about him, had access to him personally and to all of his papers and everything. And nobody, you know, I tried to go to public television. American experience, he wasn't part of their American experience. Maybe he'll become that way after he's saved in the for 20 years. But I couldn't get any money to make the film. His son basically did an interview with the, with the uh, New York Times the day after the election, or, or the week after the election, you know, said that the American Economic Association, something like three to 10, only three to 10 people saw this financial collapse come. These are the people whose business it is to monitor these trends. So if they don't speak out about it and know about it, we know that the financial media didn't do it. And I looked into that. Why is it that CNBC and all these places didn't warn us about this? And I discovered that beginning in 2002, in the aftermath of 9-11, there was a big, you know, uh, the, the dot-com crash a, you know, a year earlier. There was no advertising. Advertising had dried up. Suddenly, money from dodgy lenders and from credit card companies were all over websites. You've seen those dancing images on Yahoo and other places selling, you know, credit cards, priceless. Uh, Three billion dollars in advertising between 2002 and 2007, hyping, you know, this whole uh, bubble. They were part of it. They helped create it. They profited from it. And of course, now they're in trouble in part because they didn't prepare themselves for the likelihood, which we now see was extremely likely, that this bubble was going to crash or go down. I'm trying to make a film about it. I've written, I've done a film about this. I did a book about this. I can't find any funding to make a film about this. <coughs> so these are the challenges that independently, and I hear the cry about this, but I do think that. Part of the problem is that the people who are most informed about these issues, the people who are most sensitive to the media and the media's uh, problems and defects do not help support independent media, do not work to try to get their students to contribute money to websites, to learn about websites and the rest. They'll buy, they'll subscribe to the New York Times or some other uh, outlet, but often not on a regular basis. Uh, to websites, and maybe because the websites are boring to them and they're not interesting. I can't put it all on them. I have to take responsibility too. We're, we've been trying to improve. Yes? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, well, speaking of the classroom and the economy, I mean, this is something that is only affecting some people at the moment, but the erosion of tenure uh, in the academy and the, kind of the danger of what's happening in
that at the moment. Well, you do have that. I just was struck by that term. I never thought of it that way before. The class group. The class D. Well, you know, it's um, it's it's real. I, you know, I I agree with everything. <laughs> I, Danny's film, if you haven't seen it, about the debt. It's, it's, it was so prescient. I mean, it, how many years? Like three years before the crash? He said it was coming. It, it, and, but it started yeah. in people's homes. And so goes from being zero to a hero. <laughs> you're, you know, one day, you know, you're, you're a yucko, and the next day you're, you know, a genius. You know, I mean, I, I, I don't trust the people who call me a genius anymore than the people who basically said, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, you know, that's what happens. It's the dynamic of, you know, truth established. I forget the quote exactly. Uh, at first, it's totally rejected and, and refuted. And, you know, then it's. Uh, first, they uh, make fun of you. And, and then <laughs> briefly rehabilitated, then it becomes the conventional wisdom that everybody always knew all along. But uh, never said. <laughs> anyway, I wanted just to tell you I mean, I, I've spent a lot of the last. 10 years, 15 years, trying to start networks and seeing a kind of bigger picture. And it's very, I, I feel like we have, we do have something in free speech TV, which we need to support. Actually, I just talked to the new outreach director. She said that their funding this year is 42% of what it was at this time last year. So unless they, and, and this is something that should be growing, should be expanding, and, and I really feel that, you know, we depend on you all to promote it to your students and to help us get the word out. Um, I myself, I, I think there's a lot of problems with free speech TV. Um, and one of the things that I find and I, is, is that so much of what progressive media makers do is just one-offs, you know, it was a tape about the dead, a tape about Nicaragua, a tape about uh, Afghanistan, but you know, that's not really the way television works. And one of the things that I just finished was, and also it's so, gloomy and so often. So I, that's why I loved your film about the me and the media, because it was funny, Dan. And I like that. <laughs> but, um, well, how many people in this room will show it to their students? We saw a little bit of it. No hands are up. I mean, I, I, I'm saying, I mean, I think, <laughs> I, I think, I, I'm not challenging you to show my film. That's not my, my point. My point is find another film that's going to inspire them to engage with these issues. If this is not the one, I'm sure there are others that actually talk about these issues. Yeah. You really don't, wait, I didn't finish, let me just finish. And that is that I, I think that we need, a, 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 like that's, I think one of the reasons Democracy Now! has been successful is that it is a sustained program that people can count on. Democracy Now! and evaluate its impact. Uh, is there any data on it? Uh, who is it teaching? What's the audience? What's the approach? What, what are the things that get covered? What, what is their most experience? I mean, we did television series, as you may know, global vision. And we did a series called South Africa Now, which was uh, fighting apartheid uh, for three years. We did 156 weeks, which I don't know of any, many progressive television groups that have been on the air regularly. We're also in 40 countries, not just in the United States. We do rights to own human rights television for 62 weeks. And we started out with this idea of the Rodney King meeting in Los Angeles. You know, we're going to show all these videos of police abuse. We thought this would really be good. And then we found a lot of feedback from our viewers that they turned away from after a certain point. And that they were more interested in the features we did about human rights heroes, people who were standing up and challenging who they could identify with. Yes.
75%. Mark 75% of contingent waiver. 75? Yes. Wow. If you do not include grad students. Okay. So, yeah, that's what we're going to have. Well, I mean, I've been an adjunct, but I've also been something else. I've been trying to survive. You know, I've been back
programming decisions, you know, are made. And programming, which is the noun in TV, in the TV industry, programming department, etc. Programming is also a verb. You know, the audience is programmed to have certain expectations of what to watch and what not to watch. So you have to offer that recognition. That's why suddenly John Stewart came on with a really feisty attitude and people clocked him. You know, uh, I think it's, it's flawed in many ways, but I think it's important. And, and, and you know, the same for the onion, the same for uh, Saturday Night Live. That's what was the real excitement of the whole election cycle was, you know, you know, Peter Fay playing Sarah Taylor. That's what the kids talked about. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, no, one second. Right behind us. We're finishing the comparison. Which is, you know, which is not really uh, journalism as I've come to understand it. Okay, and I think there is a, quite a difference between the discipline and the methodology of professional journalists and people who are writing polemically about what one issue or another, or just writing experientially about their experience. I think. I think there's room for a lot of different voices and a lot of different ways to express those voices. I don't want to say one is right and one isn't right. I think a lot of people in mainstream media <coughs> were totally freaked out by this, threatened by it. I was a Neiman fellow at Harvard. I've been to a bunch of conferences with my colleagues who are, you know, in the top newspapers in America, bemoaning, you know, all of these people who don't know what they're doing, and blah, 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 blah. But, on the other hand, I think it does democratize communications. And this is one of the things that you guys have a power which I don't feel you use enough. This idea of a union of democratic communications. This idea of people who do have a critical stance towards media. 
you know, should be outspoken in the media debates that are going on. I never see or get press releases of statements, of suggestions, of analysis. The media channel, we love to run that stuff. We love to promote it, okay? If there, if there are those voices. I see you, I'll get there in a sec. Uh, you know, I think we need to get into this debate about what's happening to newspapers. I, you know, I made a comment about your article, but I think that's a provocative piece, and I think it, it should provoke a discussion, not simply a statement. It should get engaged, it could challenge some of the arrogance in a lot of mainstream media people that I know very well, because I've worked around them and been with them for many, many years. So, and many of them have also, as they begin to lose jobs or lose their media institutions, get radicalized rather quickly uh, about what's happening to them. So uh, I agree uh, with that, but I think that you folks have a responsibility to see your ideas to project them for not just in academic papers, but as a group to have a presence in this media debate. And I, I think we should do a better job with that. Yes. Um, yeah, I want to say the problem. Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> Uh, I think that one of the big things that we need to do is, is, uh, is challenge what we referred to talking about counter narratives and challenge that dominant narrative of what educators, uh, the, the, the narrative behind that. And thank you for the plug for IBW. And one of the things that we did when we organized Winter Soldier um, and when we or not only organized the event, but also when we put out the book, um, which shameless plug I have for you. But um, also that when we, when we did that, one of the biggest things that we wanted to do was challenge the dominant narrative that was being put out by politicians, politicos, generals, and not by soldiers who actually fought in Iraq. And so when we put that out, we wanted to challenge that dominant narrative. We wanted to do that not only in the here and now, but also historically. You know, we've made a push to, uh, to get educators to teach from it, to get it into libraries, this book, and things of that nature. And I think that when we talk about how to kind of work around this system of uh, instructors that are not tenured, that are not being given that time, that respect, that space, that pay, uh, one of the things that, that we need to do there is go to that source and challenge that area and make sure that students realize who's, who's teaching them, uh, how much they're, and, and also not students, parents, um, the people who are, who are going to that school, the divide that I've seen in some instructors versus the people who actually sit in their classroom is huge. And if we can lessen that divide, we challenge that traditional narrative. And, and now, granted, I've been an organizer for the past uh, few years, and even though I spent the last semester in my classroom teaching, the, the idea of it is, to me as an organizer, is to go out there and challenge it, and, and forcing that space to be more progressive. And even if it's not progressive, at least be more free in its academic free speech as, as a presenter talked about earlier today. I think Michael wanted to respond to my bashing him. No, I actually <laughs> wanted to respond to what the woman behind Mark had asked. What's your name? Yeah. Uh, Pat, Pat. I want to respond to Pat of, of Groundhog College. Yes. And um, this is not a radical institution. Uh, you know, and even talking about some of the things we've been talking about, the exploitation of faculty, the death of tenure, you know, we're, we're a union institution, we've got a strong commitment to tenure, but in the department that is co-hosting this conference, this semester we have 17 tenure-track faculty members and 37 adjuncts. So again, you know, we are very much in line with the rest of academia, yet we are co-sponsoring, along with Niagara University, this conference. Because, and, and, and how, how do we sell this to the college? And if you really look right now at the job market, our students are not getting jobs in traditional media. Our students are getting jobs in something that you might call alternative media. It might not be radical alternative media, but it, it sure as hell is an alternative to the dominant corporate media paradigm. And uh, I, I dare say, and you could counter that maybe it's just our students, but I think most of our students now, you know, they're studying public relations, they're working for human service agencies. You know, if they're studying media, we're seeing a lot of people work with newspapers, you know, the, the, the weeklies. These are where the jobs are because as, as the dominant media models are shrinking to become more profitable because, you know, you just, you can't speed the treadmill up, you know, there are all these other alternatives. 
economically downshift and you work for less money, it's a shame the journalists aren't going to be earning, you know, upper middle class salaries anymore, but there are more jobs for journalists in, in democratic media, and that is where you can sell this idea of ethical media. I don't like the term, the who brick alternative, because that's what is the mainstream, right? But it's probably just ethical versus unethical. And that's how you can sell the idea of ethical media, is because this is where students are getting hired. This is where they're getting job experience with internships. And, and basically we go into the market saying, we should be teaching this. So you bring in one or two tokens now, because this is where our students tend to be getting hired. So have somebody interpret this. But at least that's an improvement over where things have traditionally been in the field of communication and communications. But I, I, I would just like to say amen to that. And I'm gonna ask you a question. It's 9.15. How, how should we wrap this and take this to a bar and continue this discussion? Uh, you, want to, you want to do a book signing? And my book signing awaits. I'm sure you're all eager. You having, having, having heard me go on for hours, I want to just commend to you Peter Phillips, the project center, who's going to the country and speak tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning, is that correct? I really recommend you go hear him. I think you'll find it very provocative and informative uh, as well as, as Lisa's talk was this morning. Uh, you know, I just would like to give you, I know you guys are note takers to some degree, but my email, uh, danny at mediachannel.org if you want to carry on a discourse with me or have any other questions or issues you'd like to raise, you know, with you, everything I've said to stand for for my whole life. <laughs> Thank you. 